going to take a break uh, this week uh, from Romans 12 because uh, I, I want to cover something that the Lord laid on my heart, especially with, you know, uh, us waking up on Monday, finding out, you know, a bunch of folks going to a country concert being um, slaughtered. It just, for me, it, it's one of those things where, okay, it's happened again, right? It's this constant reminder that we live in this broken, evil, wicked world. And so the Lord really laid 2 Timothy 3 on my heart to share with you this morning. And we're going to talk about that um, because it seems like the world's just getting pretty crazy, right? Is it getting crazier? Um, I think so. And I'm going to tell you why I think so here in just a moment. But let's start by uh, opening up the scriptures. So 2 Timothy chapter 3 this morning. And uh, it'll be on the screen And uh, if you don't, didn't bring your paper Bible. But uh, chapter 3, verse 1. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, because in society what's good is bad and what's bad is good, traitors, heady, or headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Father, thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for uh, the truth contained in it. I thank you for the challenge it brings to us and the reminders that it brings to us. So as we uh, look in your word, may it renew our minds today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Perilous times. The word perilous uh, essentially means dangerous times. It's a dangerous time to live. And what's given here in these few verses, and we're going to look at the whole chapter, but are characteristics of what people will be like in these last days. You know, the, when it's talking last days, it's talking about the eventual end of human history. Um, human history will end one day uh, with the return of Christ. And so, it's saying, hey, this is what it's going to look like, Timothy. Now, of course, uh, things were, were kind of messed up in Timothy's time as well, as Paul's writing to Timothy. But I want to tell you why I think this is relating to our time, like right now. Because I used to be one of those, those guys who was like, ah, you know, this is probably really, really, really far away. And, you know, I, I'm not so much convinced of that anymore. Just notice some of the things um, mentioned here. Lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. The implication given there is the, the structure of the home is basically falling apart. And let's be honest, um, in our American society today, uh, having a, a mom and dad that you know get married, stay married, raise their kids is is becoming like almost a rarity, right? Um, especially you know uh, being a, a single parent and raising your kids um, uh, it can be a very difficult thing. We live in a society where there's an absence of, of fathers because we've promoted the sexual promiscuity as just this is, this is the way life is. And, um, but what that's also led to is a couple byproducts. One, the slaughter of innocent children with abortion. We've killed over 50 million children in, this, uh, in our society. And then we also have a generation where there are kids who, you know, their father's not in, in the picture by choice. Now, why am I not talking about the mothers? Um, because mothers obviously play a, a vital role in the development of a child. But it's been proven that when a father is not in the picture, the whole scene changes. And so what we have are, uh, is, is a, a fundamental collapse of the home. And, and our society has done this by demeaning marriage and uh, trying to turn it into something that it's not. But uh, if you're the enemy, if you're Satan, what you want, if you want to screw up society, you want to attack the home. And that's what's taking place. So we're, we're seeing that in our society today. We're also seeing, I mean, these other things. Look at this. Um, uh, disobedience parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, uh, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control. So if you have self-control, it's almost looked at as a, as a bad thing. Brutal despisers of good. Uh, I like in, in the King James, it says, uh, without natural affection. 
And I was, I was reading an article this week, a couple days ago, where a mom took her four-year-old, he was autistic, she tied him up, put him in the bathtub, and set him on fire. And you just think, what world are we living in, right? But should that be any surprise in a society that's killed 50 million babies, where we don't value human life? It blows your mind, right? Traitors, headstrong, haughty, meaning basically uh, conceited. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. God gave us pleasure. We know this. I mean, he created it to be enjoyed on his terms, right? When we take pleasure outside of God's natural design, uh, you get a mess. Remember, it's like taking the fire from the fireplace and putting it on your couch. It just doesn't work out very good. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. It's a pretty screwed up time, pretty scary time. Why do I, but we look at this list and you're like, come on, Brent. All of those things you just mentioned have happened throughout history. Go back three or four or five centuries. There's been sexual promiscuity. There's been people who are prideful, lack self-control, unthankful, unholy. Brent, we've seen this. This is human. I mean, this is humanity. So why do you think this is the last days? I'll tell you, I'm going to give you one verse that the Lord just shoved in my face that I think, okay, while all those things have gone on in human history, this connects some dots for me. And it's Matthew 24. If we could bring that up, please. This is Jesus talking. He says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. The gospel will go to all nations. Now think about this. In the past 100 years, mankind's ability to communicate has advanced more than in the past, I mean, several thousand years. Think about it. If you go back to, I mean, just the 18th century and say, hey, you can talk to someone real time thousands of miles away. That's crazy. Until Alexander Graham Bell comes on the scene, you're like, that's, this, what? Or furthermore, I remember when um, like Skype first came out and you could see someone really far away. Oh, my goodness. How we communicate has just been revolutionized. I remember like when texting first started coming out, kids. I'm like, why on earth would I want to text someone when I can call them and talk to them? But then, you know, you realize, oh, well, you know, you could, they could message you and you just don't have to answer right away and just deal with them a different time, right? Is that what it is? When you talk to them, it's real time. No. I was like, why would I want to do that? When I was a youth pastor, let's just go back 11 years. One of the, the, the speeches I would always give my seniors was this, was your opportunity to share the gospel with your classmates is about to come to an end because you're most likely, on a regular basis, you're not going to see these people. And that was true. I graduated in 2002, Bethel State Tigers. Go Tigers. Thank you. Got some alumni here. Oh, thumbs down, really? Hey, we're 6-0, and oh, man. Bring on West Claremont. Bring them on. Not really. You guys have a lot of people. Um, and I would tell them that, like, hey, your, your time frame to make a gospel impact in your school, it's, it's coming to a close. And now we have social media where, shoot, you keep tabs on people you hardly even know, right? You all been creeping people. Don't act like you haven't. But, yeah, you meet someone one time and they're asking for a friend request. Like, I barely know you. I really want you looking at my pictures. So just think about that. that we, we've advanced just in 10 years that Facebook's been in existence. How we communicate has radically changed. The, the ability to transmit information is on the largest scale it has ever been in all of human history. You've never been able to communicate information better than you have at this point in time in human history. So this gospel of the kingdom going to all nations, if you're telling people to do that, you know, 2,000 years ago, you know, we're going to give it our best, but that's just them talking to other people. That's, that's about the extent of the communication, face-to-face. -face. And now, man, we, we can 
cover all sorts of areas. I mean, right now, thousands of miles away, Pastor Paulo and the kids are watching us at church. They are. They watch just about every Sunday. Doesn't that blow your mind a little bit? Like, they're in not only a different country, on a different continent. They're watching our church service. It's, uh, they're eight hours ahead of us. I don't know what time it is right now, but it's getting close to evening time for them, and so they're watching church here in America. The ability to communicate is tremendous now. This, what Jesus is saying right here, is coming to fruition. The gospel of the kingdom is going to all nations and being communicated on a much broader scale than it has ever been. And so when we look at these perilous times and the craziness of society, I would say, yes, things are worse now than they have ever been. Because our communication, this is coming to fruition. Jesus said, this is the last days. I'm tying that in here with 2 Timothy 3. These are perilous times, dangerous times. Let's keep going in the text. Um, verse 6. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts. I was telling the early service, this, this verse makes me think of Hugh Hefner. You know, I mean, he was basically by the media treated as some hero, right? For uh, bringing a, in a sexual revolution. Um, what he did was he made it even more acceptable to objectify women and treat them not as people but as products and, and, and not empowering women, as some would suggest. Oh, they're, they're powerful because they can show their bodies to everybody else. No, they're making, they're making you a product, something that you, you throw away when you're done with it. Women are not products. They are people. He created these, these basically an objectification. He's not a hero. He was a wicked, vile man. And if he didn't repent of his sins, he's burning in hell right now. Lee Strobel, the author of uh, The Case for Christ, shared the gospel with Hugh Hefner. And he didn't go into detail, but he said in uh, one of his, I don't know if it was a tweet or whatever he was writing, but that Hugh failed to realize the significance of the resurrection of Jesus. Because as a Christian, that's the game changer, right? That's the hinge by which all Christianity uh, moves on is the resurrection of Jesus. Since that's true, that obviously means Jesus is God and what he says goes. And yet it's a man who's celebrated for being, well, as it says here, um, <laughs> we live in a society where bad is good and good is bad. Let's keep going here. Now as Janus and Jambres, those names may not stick out to you in like, you know, Bible trivia quiz. Name two people whose names start with J in the Bible. You're not going to come up with Janus and, and Jambres very often, right? Uh, they resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth? They resist the truth. Keep that in mind. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will manifest to all as theirs also was. Janus and Jambres were magicians. If you remember when uh, Moses and Aaron are meeting with Pharaoh and they throw the rod down and it turns to a snake, those were the magicians who were doing the same thing until eventually... Um, they were shown to be frauds. And he's saying, hey, you're going to have people just like that, thinking that they are something, and in reality, they're not. Remember, it even, even says earlier in this chapter, having a form of godliness but denying its power. There's plenty of false teachers in existence today. There have always been false teachers. But the, again, the, the widespread of information their platform is bigger than before. You know, to be a false teacher, you need about 95% truth and 5% falsehood, and you weave it in there and try to convince people that what I'm saying is right. I was blown away by an article I read um, speaking on just this topic right now. People who say there's something, but they're really not. It was a, a Methodist bishop, and which I, I guess I shouldn't be surprised by her liberal take on theology. Um, she's uh, openly gay, and thinks Jesus is a, a bigot. She didn't like how Jesus talked in some of the passages of Scripture. And I'll, I'll read to you the passage that this Methodist bishop basically thinks Jesus is kind of sexist and how he talked to this woman and wasn't kind. And um, It's not on your screen, but it will be, 
if you got your Bible, go ahead and open it to Matthew real quick. Someone who's supposed to uh, teach people the Word of God and how to follow Jesus, yet calling Jesus a bigot. She didn't like this passage. Then Jesus went out from there, uh, Matthew 15, verse 21, and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to little dogs. Jesus being mean. And he said, and she said, Yes, Lord, even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Now, exegetically, what we're talking about, the exegesis of this passage, it is talking about that the Gentiles, us Gentiles, will be brought into God's family. This woman's a Gentile lady. And Jesus is like, well, I'm the king of the Jews. What are you going to do with this? And so he's presenting that this Gentile woman puts her faith in Jesus. It's a game changer. It's, it's comparing spiritual birth versus physical birth. Because a lot of Jews thought, I'm good with God because I'm a Jew. And Jesus' message was, no, you're not. You're not good just because you were born into a Jewish family. Your spiritual condition is wicked. And so essentially Jesus is laying on some importance of a spiritual birth versus a physical birth and the fact that Gentiles, which we see in the New Testament, the, the gospel gets spread to them as well. This, this Methodist bishop didn't like how Jesus spoke and basically says he's a bigot. He's not the rock of ages. He's a clump of clay, she said. Now, just, just think about that. Wrap your head around that for a second. One who's supposed to be representing and, and teaching the Word of God presents Jesus in this light. See, one thing Jesus never did, he never sacrificed truth for a crowd. Never sacrificed truth for political correctness, which is what this, this woman's doing. Jesus told you the truth, and if you didn't like it, it was, it was too bad. Remember, he speaks to thousands of people, tens of thousands of people. Most of them leave and don't want to listen to what he has to say anymore. Like, that was Jesus. He just laid the truth out. And now we're living in times where truth is, uh, is under attack. It's treated as relative. That, well, I mean, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. The problem is, is that a true statement? It's just this circle. Truth is objective. I mean, it, it is right all the time. There is no, no, no relative truth when it comes to God's word. Furthermore, and I've got to go down this route because I feel like I get dragged into it all the time by this society we live in, is um, the Methodist church... And when I say Methodist church, I, I, don't, I haven't talked to all the pastors of the Methodist churches on 125, okay? So I, I can't say what their, the stand is for their church. For the most part, our area is pretty conservative. But the Methodist denomination, kind of like the Southern Baptist denomination we belong to, our, you know, uh, that organization makes certain decisions. Well, the, the Methodist denomination, and they very, very well may see many of uh, churches break away from them because of this. They're in a 75-week period of prayer about whether or not to affirm uh, homosexuals, ho homosexuality. So they're going to take time to pray about whether or not to say this is okay. First of all, I would, I would need a lot less than 75 weeks to pray about that, right? I mean, I, I, I need like seven-tenths of a second. You can never affirm what God has openly called sin. And this isn't just homosexual sin. This is heterosexual sin right? I mean, God created sex. That's, that's, I mean, he's the one who came up with it. To be enjoyed in the marriage relationship between a man and a woman. Now, the argument is, well, Brent, Jesus never talked about homosexuality. Okay, he never talked about uh, felony home invasion either. Can I break into your house? Because Jesus never mentioned it, right? Can I just, oh, well, Jesus didn't talk about that. I'll just show up. But Mark chapter 10 
Jesus is challenged on the issue of divorce, and he, he gives the marriage structure. He says it should be as it was from the beginning. What's he referring to? He's referring to Adam and Eve. He says a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. So when it comes to that topic of the marital relationship, Jesus is like, yeah, it's a man and a woman. Duh. That's how God created it. And the, the, the sexual intimacy is to be enjoyed in the marriage relationship. Yet we live in a society, and unfortunately it's seeping into uh, quote-unquote churches to say it's not that big of a deal. Yes, it is, because when God says something is wrong, it is wrong all the time, church. And what's going to happen is, if you believe this, you're going to get the same label that Jesus got from this bishop. Are you ready to be called a bigot? To be called narrow-minded? Now, I want to preface this real quick, though, because many Christians say the right thing in the wrong way. You ain't got to be a jerk when you're communicating truth, okay? I know I've said this a lot. We, need, we don't need a bunch of Christian jerks. We need Christians who love the truth and want to communicate that in a loving manner to those around them. Do not sacrifice truth. It is going to make you a very unpopular person. And we're given a hint of that later on in this chapter. If you're going to cling to what Jesus says, cling to what his word says, you can expect to be viewed in a negative light. This is a dark world. Let's keep going here. Um, let's go to verse 10. But you have carefully followed my doctrine manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Underline that verse, church. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Let's stop there for just a second. All right, a couple things I want us to consider in this passage. We were just given a bunch of characteristics earlier in this chapter of what this world's going to look like in these last days, and I think our society fits it perfectly. Paul now, in verse 10, gives us characteristics of how Christians should be living. He says, But you have carefully followed my doctrine. Doctrines are biblical principles, biblical beliefs. I mean, everything I just talked about when it comes to heterosexual sin and homosexual sin, I can back up with the Bible. This is what God said on the issue. If you can't back it up with the Bible, then it's not doctrine, it's a preference. So, <clears throat> Paul's saying, Timothy, you know what I believe. And I, I want you to keep in mind the exchange here. You have Paul talking to Timothy. He's instilling some things in him. And I was told a long time ago by a pastor friend of mine, Brent, you need these two relationships evident in your life. You need to have a Timothy, someone you pour into. And this isn't just for pastors. This is for us as Christians to make disciples. You should be sharing what you know about God and his word with other people. That could be your kids. That could be your spouse. That could be your friends. That could be your coworkers. That can be a myriad of people. But you're to have a Timothy, someone you pour into, but you're also, you need to have a Paul. You need to have someone that pours into you. And that's what's taking place here. Paul is saying, hey, you know my doctrine? You know my manner of life. Paul says, I practice what I preach. You know all about me. I'm an open book, Timothy. You know my purpose, my faith, my long suffering. That following Jesus isn't easy. Do you know what long suffering means? It means to suffer for like a long time. There you go. I've broken it down for you. It was difficult for Paul. Like following Jesus is a hard thing. It's much different than the prosperity gospel where it's like, you know, follow Jesus and all your problems go away. The only problem is that's not in the Bible, right? I mean, we're promised here, if you live godly, you will suffer persecution. Where's that in their, you know, their telethon? raising money for their jet, right? Like, hey, because what's going to happen is if you present the gospel and you follow Jesus and all your problems go away, um, 
what's going to happen when that person actually has a problem? They're going to think, well, that Jesus stuff's crazy. That's not real because I started following Jesus and my life fell apart. When you come to Jesus, the biggest problem that you get solved is the fact that you are a sinner separated from God, and now you're reconciled to God. And you're going to face hardship, and you're going to have hard times, but you're going to have Jesus every step of the way. That's the difference. And so if you live godly in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecutions, afflictions. I love Paul uses the word perseverance. He just says, man, stick with it. Some of you are like close to just giving up on this faith stuff and following. He says, just stick with it. It's, it's hard at times. Persevere. Keep going. And he talks about persecutions, afflictions that happened in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra. This is in Acts 13. He's in Antioch. Things go south. Okay, I'm going to go to Iconium. They get worse than Iconium. He leaves Iconium, goes to Lystra, they pick up stones and start throwing it at them. So it like went from bad to worse to even worse. He's like, but the Lord delivered me out of all of it. Yeah, things are not easy, but the Lord delivered me. Evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse. Church, this isn't going to get any better. The dysfunction that our world lives in is not going to get any better. And I've actually had people kind of pity me because I'm raising my kids now um, in this time period. Like, man, it's got to be, I just think of the world that your kids are going to grow up in and your grandkids. I don't look at it that way, and neither should you. It is no accident that God has you living and existing here in 2017. At this point in human history, God chose for you to be here now. It's not an accident. And yes, my kids will grow up in a world that is darker than before, but I'm going to teach them to be light in a very dark, dark place. And my grandkids, I hope they get taught the same exact thing. And yes, the world is going to be, be bad and get worse and worse, and you can be all gloom and doom, like, oh, this is just so horrible. Or you can stop acting like a pansy and start following Jesus, because when the world gets darker, you still have Jesus. And he said, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. So just because it's a dark world doesn't mean you just give up. You charge into the darkness with the light of the gospel of Christ. You teach your kids to do the same thing. It's going to get worse. But we got Jesus. Teach your kids to be light. I hope Rhett and Addie start following Jesus at an early age and that they love people and they love God with all that they have and they're better Christians than their mom and their dad and that they become everything God wants them to be. The world can be as dark as it wants to get, but man, what a time to be alive. What a time to exist. This church, if when you think about all these things going on, it should move you from just attending church to engaging the church, to engaging your community, to wanting to be a part of the solution and not just sitting there and letting things just happen around you. We get to be light in a very dark, dark place. I like what he tells Timothy. You must continue. Just keep going, man. Keep going. Continue in the things you've learned and been assured of. Okay, let's stop there for a second. He's learned it, but he's been assured of it. Meaning, it's one thing to have knowledge. It's another thing to believe the knowledge you possess. If you believe this book just because I tell you to believe it, or your Sunday school teacher tells you to believe it, that is only going to get you so far. Or I believe it because my mom and dad believe it. That's only going to get you so far. You yourself have to be assured that this is true. You don't follow Jesus because it's easy. You follow Jesus because it's true, right? I don't want to follow something that's false. You do it because it's true. This is actually real. Continue. Learn and be assured of. Knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. I always feel like verse 15 is for me because I'm a church kid, right? I didn't have that testimony where, you know, um, I you know, got saved in my teens and started going to church. And that's more of my parents' testimony. My parents got saved. My dad was 19. I can't remember how old my mom was. But I've always gone to church, right? Like, I don't remember periods of time not 
going to church on a Sunday. I can I count on my hands where we didn't go to church on a Sunday um, or weren't involved in some church activities. And for a church kid, you almost get like, oh yeah, yeah, this is what we do. It's just kind of our family thing. And it almost becomes boring to you. And there's nothing boring about this. That's the thing. I mean, once you actually really discover this for yourself, it's exciting and invigorating, and this is real. But for us church kids, it's like, bro, I already know this stuff. I already know what you're talking about. You know it. Timothy knew it and was assured of it, meaning he knew it, but he actually believed it was real. And he says, you've known this from childhood. Like, this is important stuff, man. Your, 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 your mom and your grandmother, they instilled this in you. These scriptures are valuable, Timothy. Parents, understand just how important it is for you to teach your kids God's word at this point in time while you have them. I, I'll have no control. You know, my kids grow up, I, I don't have any control, I mean, of what their spiritual condition will be. I can teach them the word of God try to be the best example that I can be. And one of the most important things you can give, actually the most important things, Christians, we can give our kids is our relationship with God. Because if they feel like mom and dad aren't really serious about this, do you really believe they'll take it seriously? They won't. That's why many walk away from their faith. And you know, you may have kids right now that you raised in church, you're like, Brent, I did all the right things. I'm still living out my faith. I'm still passionate about this, and my kids are not walking with God whatsoever. One, you fulfilled your responsibility. Your job now, pray and be a godly example for them. But I believe that one day, it's going to click for them. The, the, the scriptures, what's been instilled in them, you know, train up a child in the way they should go when they're old, they won't depart from it. That's, that, inf that information, that truth that's in your child, that's going to come in handy one day, and there's going to be an aha moment where it's like, what the heck am I doing? There's a God who loves me. I remember what that was like. I remember following after God, and I need to, I need to get right with God. It may not happen when they're in their 20s or 30s or 40s or even when you're alive, but I believe God's word will come to fruition in their life. Because if they're a child of God, God will chastise them to bring them back. To say, hey, you belong to me. Act like it. Continue. I mean, you've known these things from when you were a child, Timothy. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Your biblical principles, your biblical beliefs, the truth. Again, have Scripture to back up what you believe and do not deviate from it. Ever. This word is profitable. It means it's for your benefit. For doctrine, for reproof, reproof is basically, hey, you're wrong. If God said, hey, what you're doing is wrong, would you listen to him? Because that can be, that can tick you off. Like, come on, God, I'm not bad as this person, or seriously, this is so old-fashioned. God said, don't do it. You know what that means? Don't do it. If he says do it, do it. He makes it real simple for us. For reproof, for correction, not only does it tell us our, uh, we're wrong, it gives us that smack in the back of our head, right? You're wrong. Pfft. Straighten up. And then instruction in righteousness and how to live this life. We've been talking about that in Romans 12. As the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Yes, we live in a dark, dark time. It's going to get worse. Is it the last days? Probably. I can't say exactly for sure, but I'm kind of thinking we're pretty close to that. But man, what a time to be a Christian, to, to, to finish our course, to run our race. I was... Um, visiting with Kathy's mom, Linda, the other day. And I, I mentioned that to Linda because Linda only has months to live. And um, she wants her family to know all about her faith, 
She's got a bunch of Bibles she's writing in to give all of them. I mean, what a gift, first of all. They're going to cherish the, the Bible given to them. And my comment to Linda was this. Linda, you're finishing your race like so many of us want to. You're, you're sprinting. You're running strong. Your, the, her course is coming to an end, but she's not walking. She's, she's running towards it. She wants to finish her course. Leave a godly example for her family and a godly influence for her Lord. It's a dark world. It's going to get darker. There's going to be more tragedies. There's going to be more times where we wake up, we check our news feed, and a bunch of people have been slaughtered senselessly. And let those be reminders for us that God has you existing here and now. And the greater the darkness, the greater the need is for light. We are the salt of the earth. We are light. We are that city on a hill, church. I'll end with Romans 12 as we've been in there. If you notice, Paul's admonition to Timothy was, you need God's word, man. It's a dark world. Don't discount the word. It's profitable to you. As we saw last week, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do we renew our mind? It was through God's word through studying it, through reading it, through memorizing it, through meditating upon it, listening to it. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Don't discount this marvelous letter God has left us. We need this. We need it to transform our way of thinking. And the world needs us to proclaim its truths. And yes, you'll be called bigot. Yes, you'll be called closed-minded and foolish. But they're calling Jesus that too. And at the end of the day, I'm going with Jesus every single time. Because last time I checked, I don't know anybody else who they killed him and they came back to life, right? Not like he was resuscitated. The guy was dead and resurrected to prove to us I'm everything I claim to be. So I'm going with him every time. It's a dark world. Church, we're light. Would you pray with me today? Let's bow together.